of us have this experience, you know, as we're sitting here right now, it feels very much like there's an objective world outside me that exists and it has space and it, things change over time. And consciousness is this, it's kind of like, especially with perception, it's like a pristine window that we kind of see out onto an objective world that just, it looks the way it looks and it's stable. When I close my eyes, it's still there. Uh, so maybe a good place to to kind of go more incrementally at, at, at this idea is is the question of whether we see reality as it is. Right, right. So most of us intuitively just say, of course, I see reality. I look up and I see the moon. You look you look up and you see the moon. We're seeing the same moon. And you know, there are footprints on that moon because we've been there and we've we've got we've got some machinery that we've left there on the moon, some rockets and so forth. Um, so of course the moon exists. And and you know, we look, you know, paleontologists dig around and they find bones from creatures that lived millions of years ago. So they 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 they're real. Yeah, you know, how, how could those bones be there? And and I, I'm saying that we create the moon when we look and we destroy it when we look away. There is some objective reality that exists whether or not I look. But that objective reality is nothing inside space and time. And I think that the way to make that sort of clear and understandable, because it sounds crazy when I put it that way, it just sounds crazy, but think about virtual reality. So you put on headset and bodysuit and say you're playing a, a, a race car video game with some friends, you know, it's, it's a network game, you're on friends around the world. You have some, a friend in China, someone in Europe, you know, playing, you know, racing with you. And you look over to your right, so you turn your heads over that way, and you see a you know a green Mustang. Then you look over there, and you see a red Ferrari. Well, your friends around the world who are playing the game will say, "Oh yeah, I see the green Mustang. I see the red Ferrari." So you all agree that there's a green Mustang and there's a red Ferrari. But in objective reality, is there a green Mustang and a red Ferrari? No. You, you render in your consciousness the green Mustang when you look over there with your headset, and then you render the red Ferrari. When I look and see the red Ferrari, I garbage collect, I throw away the, the green Mustang. It no longer exists. In this metaphor, what exists is a supercomputer that's running the game, right? There's, so there's one, there's a fabulous computer that's running the game. And so we have this illusion of a shared physical reality in which there's a green Mustang and a red Ferrari. But, but of course, those playing the the virtual reality game are not going to be taken in. You understand that, yeah, I, I'm creating the green Mustang when I look over there. You might say, well, no, I'm not creating it. I can prove that the green Mustang really exists. So I'll, I'll close my eyes and I'll have my friend in China. Do you still see the green Mustang? He says, oh yeah, I still see the green. See, they're proof that it really does exist. No, it just means that my friend in China is creating his own Mustang in his consciousness because he turned his headset the right way. There is no green Mustang. You might say, well, um, I can, I can feel. So I've, maybe you're playing virtual tennis. I can, or I can feel the Mustang. So I can put my hand out and feel the Mustang even when I'm not looking. Well, so if you have the right force sensors on your in your bodysuit, then sure you'll you'll feel something. But that's just because now you're creating the force experiences. But that doesn't mean that there's really a Mustang. And the other thing to say is like, well, uh, I see how the Mustang's moving. I'm going to close my eyes. And so I know that I, if I open my eyes, the Mustang should be over there. And I look, oh yeah, the Mustang is right where I expected it to be. So, so that means that it really did exist. So all the things that we would say about, you know, like a tennis ball, why, you know, why does the tennis ball exist? Well, my friend sees it when I don't see it. I can feel it when I'm not looking. If I drop it, I can know where to look and it's there. So that proves that the tennis ball really exists. None of that works. None of it goes through. Just think about virtual reality. You can do all the same experiments in virtual reality. You get the same answers and there isn't, a pre-existing you know, tennis ball or, so I'm saying space-time is your headset. Everything inside space-time that you perceive, you render when you look and you garbage collect, you throw it away when you look somewhere else and then you render something else. You render the moon when you look and then you garbage collect it when you look away. The reason why you get the same answer every time you look is that you are interacting with an, a, some kind of objective reality. It's just not in reality in space and time. Space and time is just our little headset. So our species has made a fundamental rookie mistake. We've mistaken our little VR headset for the truth. It's just that simple. And that's what science is waking up to. Science is recognizing that science so far 
has been almost exclusively a science of what's inside space-time. We've been studying our headset, and that's important. We now understand our headset very, very well. For the first time, science is ready now to say, okay, what's outside of our headset? What is the reality that we're really interacting with? It's not space, time, and matter. That was a rookie mistake. It was a good mistake. I mean, it's been a very, very useful framework for centuries, but now it's time for us to grow up as a species and, and begin to explore what might be outside of our space-time headset. There is a supercomputer out there, you know, quote unquote, a supercomputer. What is the nature of that thing? What is it? What is the reality that we're really dealing with? It's not space-time and it's not microphysical particles. It's not neurons. It's not brains. It's not the moon. It's something far, far deeper. And all those things, microphysical particles, space-time, neurons, the moon, these are little symbols, little icons that we create in our headset as we interact with this deeper reality. So what is that deeper reality? That's the challenge for the next generation of scientists. Yeah, I feel like another uh, maybe objection that people might come up with is that beyond just being able to kind of look and see that the, um, the object is there, it feels like um, there's a kind of continuity over time of the effects of objects, even if we're not looking at them, you know? So before life emerged on Earth, I have this feeling that there was, even though it may not be, um, even though space-time may be emergent, that there's something going on where there's a kind of spherical object, spherical in some, in some sense, that's or orbiting the Earth that we call the moon, that is having an effect on the tides and that could have a causal influence on the origins of life. You know, that's the way um, we're kind of educated, I guess, to think about these things in, in the kind of standard, standard view of things. How does that kind of thing fit in with your theory? Right. So, so when I say that space time is doomed, that, that includes time. So time is also just part of the story that, that, that we're telling. And, and the fact that we can tell a consistent story, we can look back th for 13.8 billion years in our story and, and get a consistent story it does not entail that, that our story is true. It tells, it tells us that it's, it's, you know, it's consistent, but the, 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 the fact that I can see dinosaur bones and say, well, they, they lived 67 million years ago or 200 million years ago. Um, that's, that's all a story that I'm telling in my headset in my virtual reality headset. Now, the, the part that's right about that is that there, I mean, people will say, well, but there surely is something that exists independent of me and whether I look. And I agree with that. I mean, there is something that exists and is going on, um, but not in space and time. Um, space and time is just um, our headset. So one way to think about this from, from my point of view is um, where, I, where I'm taking consciousness as fundamental is, is think about reality, and this is what I'm proposing, as a vast social network of, of interacting consciousnesses. So consciousness is fundamental in this theory. And again, of course, I'm probably wrong, but, but, but at least I'm being precise so we can figure out where it's wrong. Um, so think of it, it's like the Twitterverse, right? Twitter, this vast social network, there's tens of millions of users, billions, literally billions of tweets, dozens of things tre trending. There's no way for any Twitter user to read all the tweets or interact with all the Twitter users. So you, you really can't grasp everything that's going on there. So how do we, when we have this overwhelming social data, what do we do when we try to understand like what's trending in the United States versus what's trending in London, zooming into Irvine, zooming out to California, zooming out to all of North America, what do we do? Well, we, we have visualization tools, maybe a, a virtual reality visualization tool that gives us little colorful icons that are moving in certain ways that's, that let me see what's trending in New York versus London versus you know, Shanghai, um, and then zoom in and zoom out. And the, the best tools will have a nice consistent structure to them. So I can zoom in consistently, zoom out consistently, and I won't get jarring changes. It, you know, it, it should be a nice smooth transition. You know, sweep across North America to Europe and see what's happening. Well, that's what um, we have. Uh, space and time is just our little headset. It's a visualization tool that we use to interact with this um, boundless network of interacting conscious agents. And not all conscious agents will use space and time. There are as many different varieties of headsets as you can imagine for visualizing um, the interaction. So 
it's a, so we're just certain conscious agents that use space and time, a, a fairly sophisticated headset to interact with this overwhelming amount of social data that we otherwise couldn't understand. Um, so fortunately, our, our, our headset is fairly consistent. We have a, a, a notion of time that seems to work for us, but it's not deeply true. It's just a headset. So are those conscious agents interacting over time in your model? They're not interacting over time. They, they do interact, but they, and they, there is a notion of order. So in the mathematics that I'm working on, this is a little bit more technical. There is no notion of time, not, not Newtonian time, not even a, uh, a Lorentzian you know, time, like a special relativity or, or general relativistic notion of time. It's, it's uh, asynchronous total orders that one can collapse um, the, the complexity of these total orders. So there is a, a notion of a sequence of experiences, but, but the sequence for one agent, the sequence for another agent could be completely asyn asynchronous. So you now we can simplify that and impose a total order on the whole thing. And that's what we call our time. 